As Pokémon generations come and go, the starters tend to be among the most well thought out and designed Pokémon. Or the worst, depending on who you ask, but that's the point. You see, they have to be memorable. They have to have varying personalities, at least in later generations. The, the early gens didn't focus on that so much. But of course, being so boldly a thing means people are going to have stronger opinions about them than your generic Pokémon fodder. But what we have here are the three starters from Paldea, a region based on the Iberian Peninsula which today is Spain and Portugal, and as icons, they work well in pulling both countries together, and they work well in showing their historic involvement abroad. And then there's Skeledurge. Gosh dang it, you are the most over-designed thing, and your lore and origins are so deep and all over the place, and so, so greatly speculative. What do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> Yeah, that figures, but let's start by explaining the deep origins of the Sprigatito line and end with Blaziken's bottom. This is Every Paldean Starter Explained. <laughs> Rigatito, Florigato, and Meowscarada, a kitten turned cat turned Iberian lynx. They've got the iconic lynx cheek tufts after all, and in many ways they resemble the Fleur de Lis, an iconic European heraldic symbol most often associated with the French royal family, but it is also seen in numerous Spanish coat of arms. Being a kitten, Sprigatito's little neck fluff ruff fittingly looks like these European children's collars, known as plastrons, especially when more formal. Formalized. They are from the Victoria era onward, and were typically pinned or tied onto the main outfit. It was kind of like a bib, except worn all the time, and it was removable from the main clothing to make cleaning up the messy children easy. But this actually wasn't their original purpose. Before the Victorian fashion industry made them all thin and frilly and turned them into commoners everyday wear, plastrons were originally made for fencers to wear. They were made with thick, sturdy fabric to protect the areas that get poked real good. You see, fencing was invented in ancient Greece, but it was hugely popular in Spain. And Spain is also where today's fencing weapon of choice, the rapier, was invented. And this is all incredibly fitting for this Pokemon as we evolve it. So, Florigato is really fun, and it's up there with Duat. It's among my favorite middle evos for starters. Florigato uses a thin vine ending with a hard flower bud as a yo-yo-like weapon, which is really interesting. But fun facts, the name Yo-Yo comes from the Philippines, as they were hugely popular there. In fact, the guy who first mass-produced them was Filipino, and it was, of course, the Spanish who first introduced Yo-Yos to the Philippines, where, supposedly, they were modified and used as weapons for hunting, thrown to get tangled up in the prey's legs. Almost perfect for a cunning predator like the lynx. And throwing its Yo-Yo out to do tricks and attacks with the way that it does is very similar to how one would stab with a rapier as a fencer. It's the same sort of arm motion, and this sword is of course the weapon of choice for the classical fairy tale character, Puss! An upright standing rapier fighting cat who, in a few classical depictions, wears a similarly frilly collar, though most of the time he's just got a belt, hat, cape, and boots. But even without that connection, Florigato standing so upright and having these long, dark patches of fur on its lower legs, which are topped like a boot cuff, and it wearing a tabard, makes this connection quite obvious. Even its cry. Aha! It is reminiscent of the trope of the iconic, handsome Spanish rogue. Very fitting as Puss in Boots was originally written in French by an Italian, but is about a Spanish cat taking on Spanish stereotypes of the time. While cunning and devious rogues can be any nationality, in popular media they are most often of French or Spanish origin, often bringing out a rose from nowhere like a magic trick in order to try and sway or swoon someone, either romantically or in an attempt to swindle them, or both. They almost always have ulterior motives, though, and are never really fully the good guy. They are often seen as anti-heroes at best, or full-on villains at worst, which of course is very fitting of this Pokémon's eventual dark typing when it evolves and gains a mask. A mask just like several of the examples you've been seeing, and while most often a handsome man, there are plenty of female characters who fit in with the trope perfectly, too. Heck, look at Digimon's Rosemon, the Rose, the mask, 
mask, the long boots, and the vine reminiscent of a rapier, and the bud holding the cloak on just like Flora Gatto. And while roses are the most common flowers, they don't necessarily have to be. But using a rose is popular because it's very perfectly symbolic here. Roses symbolize romance, yes, but also mystery and secrecy. A mysterious masked rogue offering a rose is saying, Oh, madame, I seek your embrace, your romance, but be careful. While beautiful, I am also dangerous. Reveal too much or get too close, and my thorns will cut. And actually, you know what? Pokemon has already done this trope a lot. James, James, James is like already the perfect example of this. Mysterious, handsome, and suave, loves roses, and is a bit of a romantic bad guy. As is one of May's rivals, Drew, but to a much, much lesser extent because he's like 10. And, and heck, Roserade, a masquerading rose, a whole other Pokemon for this trope. It's even got the same kind of mask and cape as Meowskareda. What the heck? So let's talk about that now. Meowskareda is now fancy and masked. A masquerading cat. Masquerade parties were all the rage for a time in Central and Southern Europe, France and Italy most famously, but they were everywhere. And Meowskareda's mask also also somewhat resembles mascara, eyelash makeup that makes them appear much bigger and darker. While mascara was invented by a Frenchman, he named it after the Spanish word for mask, and masquerade masks eventually became a big part of the holiday Mardi Gras, particularly in Louisiana, which Spain ruled for quite some time before losing it to the French and then being sold to the USA. But Mardi Gras in particular is especially worth mentioning because of its own association and symbolism with jesters. And and Meowskareda for sure resembles a jester, sort of a precursor to modern magicians and clowns who were entertainers in the medieval and renaissance eras, which would often do tricks with things like yo-yos. They would juggle balls and juggle swords and throw rings, sometimes catch them on fire even. And another classic magician and jester trick was, of course, popping flowers out of nowhere, making this the perfect follow-up and evolution to Florigato, who does the same with its hard yo-yo flower bud. But more Importantly, it's the same thing that all of those suave rogues seem to do. Pull a flower out of nowhere. Fun fact! Famed artist Diego Velazquez has an entire series of portraits dedicated to the many jesters of Spanish King Philip IV, who famously loved jesters significantly more than most other kings on record, bringing them in from all over the world even. And another fun fact, remember all the Fleur de Lis looking fur tufts in this line's design? Sprigatito especially. Well, that's actually a big reason why the iconic jester hat looks the way that it does. It's a mockery of the royal symbol. More on that soon, but Meowskareda's official description states that it is prideful and likes to show off. A perfect follow-up to Sprigatito being capricious and attention-seeking and Florigato being a mischievous show-off desiring attention and company. If its trainer won't entertain it, Florigato may try to get their trainer by misbehaving. It might wrap up its trainer with its vine in their sleep for for example. And honestly, that's pretty fitting of mischievous, young, attention-seeking house cats. I'm pretty sure many of them would actually do that if they had thumbs and plant powers. Again, it's very fitting of the dark type, and very fitting of the rogue tropes. Rogues tend to be very handsome and very prideful of their looks, and they love attention and putting on shows or making dramatic entrances and dramatic exits. And this, of course, makes becoming a magician or court jester the perfect career path. As soon as the show starts, all eyes are on it, and how perfect for its skills of pulling flowers out of nowhere, the most iconic of magician tricks other than, like, pulling a rabbit out of a hat, and its big mask and cheek tufts do for sure closely resemble the pointed face parts on the Iberian lynx while also being a jester's hat, and this could be fitting of its dark typing too. You see, many royal court jesters had two main parts of their job. One was, as stated, simply telling jokes and entertaining guests with tricks and such, but the other part was making soft mockery of the king. Hence, some jester hats often resembling exaggerated crowns and them carrying around false scepters. The people would come in and praise the king all day, and the king then might become blindsided to some of the lesser known problems in his kingdom or even in his method of ruling. So, the jester was there to be a bit of a bully to the king, saying things that would have others hanged, poking fun, teasing, and making humor out of otherwise dark situations. 
jesters typically only played the fool and were actually quite cunning and full of wit. I mean, you'd have to be to come up with songs and jokes on the spot, and such thoughtful deceit is again the perfect follow-up to a dexterous and tricky rogue who has a way with words. But then, given how its signature move causes spotlights to come down upon it, sound effect and all, you can see that there's certainly some more modern clown and magician motifs in there as well. But wait, wait, hang on. That flower thing that it just dropped on the dude's head? That, that exploded. Like, it appearing over the opponent's head makes sense. Illusionary magician tricks and all that. But a flower? Exploding? Well, yes. Plenty of plants have exploding seed pods and such, and Hisuian Voltorb is literally a seed bomb, which we cover in its video. So it's not that strange. However, uh, quote, Meowskareta can attach its pollen-packed flower bombs to to various surfaces and choose when to set them off. With skillful misdirection, Meowskareta rigs foes with flower bombs and sets them off before foes realize what's going on. Alright, cool, so it's a pollen bomb. Pollen typically is not explosive, but now that you mention it, I've seen exploding roses somewhere before. Who did that? Oh, it turns out that's a small part of the same trope too. Bouquets and flowers that aren't what they seem. The most obvious example being the classic clown and jester squirting flower lapel gag, which has been a thing for centuries now and has countless examples. Sometimes it even goes too far, like when the Joker squirts acid, or when Rosa Raid squirts poisonous liquid, or when Floragato, who has its flower bud in the same location that these clowns and such all have, it pulls it out and it's, haha, I fooled you, this is actually a weapon I'm going to beat you with now. And then, while not as common, having flowers or bouquets explode isn't unheard of in media. Often it's just for show, getting petals everywhere as a part of a dramatic entrance or special effect, but sometimes it is to attack and kill. Like in the classic anime Gacha Man, where the Devil Star assassins kill people with bombs disguised as roses. Actually, speaking of classic anime, this is Doronjo from Yataman, which also got its start in the 70s, and not only does she have the same style of boots, mask, and cape, and is a villain that loves attention and always has a trick up her sleeve, but also she has an affinity for bombs, and there's explosions galore! Most of the time they backfire, though. Actually, side note, her team of three consists of a serious pretty lady and two goofball dudes. They always get into shenanigans with the hero of the story, and in nearly every episode they build a wacky animal-themed vehicle that they pilot, and they usually explode, causing them to blast off again, although they have their own catchphrase, and then they're always stuck pedaling their multi-person bike, so in many ways, they are a precursor to Team Rocket in the Pokemon anime. The timeline of events works out too. The kids and teens growing up in the 70s and early 80s watching these would be the ones making and designing Team Rocket in the anime in the late 90s. There's definitely inspiration going on. And considering how much the Pokemon anime has been referencing other iconic anime as of late, I wouldn't be surprised if the episode featuring Meowskareta would play off of Yataman. Actually, Yataman himself uses a magical ball on a string toy as a weapon. Not unlike Meowskareta, magician's trick bomb on a stem. But now, back to exploding flowers and bouquets specifically. There's some real-world examples of this too. In the 80s, the San Francisco Bay Area was terrorized by the Bouquet Bomber, who disguised pipe bombs as flower bouquets. And in the 90s, India's Prime Minister was assassinated by a woman who seemingly only wanted to give him a bouquet, but actually she had bombs strapped all around. It's all a trick, all a ruse for dark misdeeds. But that's hardly the kind of thing a real real jester or magician would do. But now that you mention it, magicians did use a lot of smoke and mirrors and small explosions to distract and pull off many of their more extravagant tricks. Meowskareta's official description even mentions it uses the fur lining its cape to reflect and scatter light, thus camouflaging the stem of its flower bomb and making it look like the flower bomb is floating in midair. Levitation of the self and of objects is another classic magician's trick, typically always pulled off with barely visible thin wires that thanks to the special lighting at the theater, the audience has no chance of seeing. Yeah, because you know, in a world where nearly all fish and even some rocks just float for no reason, you can't believe that a cat furry with plant powers would be able to make a small flower float? Yeah, absolutely no way. My suspension has been disbelieved. Magicians as we see them today started in the late 19th century. Magic had died down a lot once claims of witchcraft started getting out of hand, but uh, once that was all over and dealt with 
with, it started to gain traction again, and a Frenchman, Jean-Eugene Robert Houdin, who attended the University of Orleans, is often credited as the father of modern magic, and he personally began the golden age of magicians. At first, magicians found themselves simply in sideshows and carnivals, conjuring balls and flowers from their sleeves, but then they began filling small theaters, and their tricks got more extravagant, utilizing the enclosed spaces lighting to make things hover, and trick boxes were being used to pull rabbits and entire bouquets from hats, and then they made it big baby Broadway and vaudeville shows. Women were being sawed in half, and magic magazines hit public stores. Now anyone could do card and coin tricks, and subclasses of magicians started popping up, like Harry Houdini, the escapetologist, able to dexterously wiggle out of anything, and then TV happened, and Chris Angel ruined it all! <laughs> Uh, but yes, many magicians would actually sneak little smoke bombs into ordinary objects to enhance the spectacle of making them disappear. Hence, Mouskareta's flower bombs. They appear and disappear with a boom! In quotes! And actually, one other big famous trick from the early golden age of magicians was Pepper's Ghost. It allowed magicians to summon illusionary ghosts that weren't actually there, and it literally needed smoke and mirrors to pull off the effect. And after all, Mouskareta is a bit of an illusionist and resists ghost-type attacks. It sees through their tricks and illusions. That's not a real ghost, maybe. But uh, yeah, so, so bringing up Pepper's ghost gives us a smooth transition into our next line of Pokemon, a ghost Pepper. But before we dive into that mess, it's important to note, both for all of the Mardi Gras inspirations with Meowskareta and all of Fuecoco's design origins that we'll get to, um, that in general, the design origins of starter Pokemon don't always perfectly align with the exact country or region that the Pokemon region is based on, but rather connect in different ways. I mean, we just had a chameleon and a gorilla in Galar, neither of those live in England, but they make sense when you consider the whole British Empire, as well as modern British cultural icons. And then like, what is a French royal penguin doing in northern Japan? Cats aren't native to Hawaii, in fact they've destroyed it more than anything, and fennec foxes are not French at all. But Delphic oracles now, they're also not French. Uh, but what am I getting at? Well, like how the last Pokémon incorporated a lot of Spain's neighbors, France and Italy especially, and also got some overseas things mixed in there. These uh, next three Pokemon, I mean, look at them. While they have plenty of actually Spanish origins too, they clearly have some Mesoamerican origins in them as well. And I mean, like, Quaquaval is the most Brazilian Pokemon in existence, which is also very fitting of Portugal, but we'll get to that. Let's talk Fuecoco, Crocolore, and Skeleturge. First of all, Fuecoco is a little chili pepper shaped crocodile, fitting as it eventually gains the ghost type. It's like it's a ghost pepper, it's so hot it kills you. But already, we have our first not Spanish thing. Peppers do not live in Europe. They are native to the Americas. Europe did not have peppers until they were brought back. Same with tomatoes, actually. Now think about traditional Italian food. Yeah, not so traditional after all, huh? Food is a culture meant to be shared! Uh, anyway, the white faces on all three of these Pokemon are notable because they somewhat resemble skulls, and Cocodrilo is Spanish for crocodile, while Coco, or Coco, means skull. In fact, there's also a folklore ghost monster named Coco, or Kuka, depending on the region, and it is a boogeyman-like ghost draconic crocodile thing with messy hair, whose tales are told throughout both Iberia and Latin America, perfectly fitting of Skeledurge, who similarly brings together a lot of elements from both regions. In Brazil, Kuka is a more humanoid female crocodile with big hair, and she has many somber songs about her used to scare children, as she's known for being completely voracious and unsatisfiable. So, she scarfs down children whole, like a crocodile. Or like Fuecoco, who's so hungry all the gosh darn time, please feed it! And perfectly, because, you know, coincidences don't exist, the Kuka has a lifespan of around a thousand years, and when she dies, her soul, specifically, becomes a songbird, specifically, who sings somber songs about its miserable gosh dang life. But in other regions, like Portugal, Coco is just a dragon, and in Spain it has a coconut body? Uh, but if you notice, this mythical dude looks like a derp, and is very round with stubby legs. So, kinda like Fuecoco and Crocolore, I guess. So then, the body of Skeledurge could
could pull from the Drac de Nacoca, a crocodile whose legend says it terrorized the sewers of Palma in Spain. It was eventually caught, killed, and mummified, and is now on display in the museum. However, perhaps due to a curse, its face, and only its face, has decayed away, revealing the skull underneath. Perhaps like this Pokemon line's white faces, Skeledurges especially. I mean, it's got skeleton in the name. This Japanese name has bone. Like, what else do these guys gotta do with bones? Another Spanish crocodile ghost of sorts is the Magdalena Lizard, or Lagarto de la Melena, who, depending on the source, can be either more lizard-like, more dragon-like, or more straight up it's just a crocodile-like. But this 1628 legend is about this creature living in a cave and spooking people at night like a spooky ghost. And the way the local knights finally killed it was by setting it on fire after feeding it flammable tinder and gunpowder, then setting it ablaze. It slowly burned from the inside out. Oh, very fitting. But there is yet another Spanish crocodile ghost, the Cocoyona of Girona. There was a nun who was accused of being unfaithful, so she was locked away as punishment. Her undernourished body became weak and skeletal before she eventually grew scales and became crocodilian, as one does. She was mournful and somber, but thanks to her real faith, she sprouted fiery orange butterfly wings perhaps like Skeletor's hair. And after her death, her spirit remained in this winged crocodile form, and she haunts the Anyar River. So there's a lot of ghost crocodiles in Spanish-speaking areas, it turns out, even though they don't even live in Spain. What is that about? I mean, did you ever? <laughs> Oh, you lived on what is Iberia today six million years ago, but then you went extinct? And that's why you're ghost type? You're an extinct crocodile? That's dumb, I don't believe you. But really though, it's likely just because the Spanish word for croc is so close to the Spanish word for skull. It's like how in East Asia, the number four is considered unlucky and the number of DEATH! Because in many East Asian languages, the word for four sounds very similar, if not the same, as the word for death. Funny how humans do that. But on a brighter note, looking at these Pokemon, I can't help but think about sugar skulls, edible decor that is often used at a time to honor the dead, especially in Mexico. And remember, Spain was heavily involved in Latin America, so some crossover makes sense. But this patterning we see on Skeledurge could both relate to extra-large crocodile scales as well as the many mosaic sculptures, walls, and art just across Spain. It's a very Iberian style, and one of the most famous sculptures in that style is El Drac, or the Gaudi Lizard in Barcelona. Just look at them colors and shapes! But these color varieties and shapes may also relate to another aspect of this line. They're putting on a show. They're decorative. The latter two, after all, are singers. In fact, Crocolore is a bad singer. Its official description says that its voice cannot be considered beautiful. Uh, perhaps its singing so poorly is why it eventually moved on to singing only dirges, hence the name Skeledirge. A dirge is a somber, mournful piece of music. Think funeral music, sad songs about loss or ghosts, like many of the songs about the Coco. In fact, it being a singer is perhaps why its chest resembles a piano and its tail resembles the neck of a saxophone phone, and its head may resemble a Spanish lute, the purple spot right here being the hole, and the spaces between the other shapes would then be the frets. And after all, its Japanese name is Loud Bone, both because it shows bones and it is loud, but also because loud is the Spanish word for the Spanish lute. Huh? And then its flame hair is sort of like stereotypical conductor hair, or even that of an opera singer like Luciano Pavarotti, an Italian who is considered one of, if not the most famous opera singer. And look, same hair, same outfit too, which also resembles the outfit of your stereotypical mariachi singer, who do also sing a lot of somber dirges and wear sombreros like Crocolore. In fact, Crocolore's Japanese name is Achigator. It is a hot mariachi alligator. But notably, opera singers often use vibrato, which is when you vibrate the pitch of your voice like this. <laughs> This is very fitting of a crocodile, though, because they do the same thing with their own bellows to vibrate water and attract a mate with their song. 
Crocodiles and alligators are actually the most vocal of all reptiles, so if you're making any reptile a singer, a crocodile makes the most sense. And both crocodilians and opera singers sing or bellow with their diaphragm, rather than focusing on the lungs and vocal cords. It really is perfect. Hey, so we're finishing up this video, right? And then just yesterday I learned about this recent movie called Lyle Lyle Crocodile, and it's about a singing crocodile, and the Italian dude that discovers and promotes him, who's a magician by the way, has the same hairstyle too! Why is this a thing? Singing crocodiles? This hair? This movie is technically a remake of one from the 80s, which itself is based on a book from the 60s. So unbeknownst to me, this association of singing and crocodiles has just been a thing. I guess it's just because of crocs being super vocal reptiles and bellowing the same way opera singers do. And now, let's say you want to go see an opera singer, or even just some pop star or something. You gotta buy tickets. Where do you want to sit in the concert stadium? Oh look, these colors and shapes also resemble those on Skeledirge. <laughs> and it's got like those fancy pyrotechnics behind the stage to make the show all big and fiery. Oh my gosh, and the bird that it has, the little bird I haven't even mentioned yet. It stands on the end of the catwalk, the place where the pop and rock stars will typically stand. And come to think of it, it being there could even be like the decorative birds on the tops or ends of various Native American flutes, the Lakota's drone flutes especially, and some of these flutes were double-barreled, double-wide, which was to simplify the traditional playing two at once style. Perhaps then, like the two sets of mosaics along Skeledurge's nose. And again, it's very important to note that Spain not only colonized and got involved with basically all of Latin America, but also initially colonized most of what is the US today, including all of what was considered Lakota territory. Good old burning and pillaging. Oh wait, that's sad. But speaking of fire, what's with the fireball bird? Well, crocodiles and alligators are often said to have semi-symbiotic relationships with various small birds. They let the birds onto them and even in their mouths to help peck it clean of bugs. And in return, the birds get to eat. Skeledirge even has this animation where its birdie pal does just that. However, I say semi-symbiotic here because it's not prevalent enough to be considered fully symbiotic. As in, it's actually not considered a thing by science whatsoever. By which I mean, the claim of them being symbiotic was proven as fraud. Like, there are photos of it happening, but it happens so rarely, and also whenever it does happen, the croc's behavior implies that the birds are uninvited. So no, it's not really a thing, it's an old wives' tale, an old myth, but regardless, the idea stuck. Think like Vikings with horns. So, this Pokémon references that idea just fine. But now, let's consider this South American deity from the Mochica. Moro is a humanoid iguana who carries a bird on its head and is a mediator between the land of the living and the land of the dead. That bird looks almost like a rooster, which makes me wonder if Portugal's rooster of Barthelos is relevant with Skeledurge too. After all, Skeledurge's bird looks like a little cartoony baby chick, but this famous rooster is a common symbol and souvenir in Portugal, and the story it's associated with is about a Spanish man passing through Portugal, and he is falsely accused of thievery and is to be hanged. He falls before the judge, who currently is at a banquet with a whole row roasted rooster right in front of him, and the man pleads his innocence to the judge and says, It is as certain as I am innocent that the rooster will crow when they hang me. And so the judge chose not to eat the whole roasted rooster, and the kind and recently passed rooster's soul sees this, and when the man is about to be hanged, it re-enters the body of the roasted rooster, still hot from the oven, and it crows, saving the innocent man. And in honor of this, the man made the original statue. But still, this is a story about a dead, hot, and roasted rooster coming back to life from a bird's soul. Sounds a lot like Skeledurge's bird who helps the crocodile part of it plenty, huh? And to make this bird and croc grouping even better, remember that the first two mon in this line are particularly pepper-shaped, and peppers evolved to be spicy for a reason. They evolved specifically to be eaten by birds. Peppers are hot and spicy to keep mammals away. Mammals have molars, and they crush and destroy the pepper's seeds, whereas birds can't taste spicy, and they swallow the seeds whole. So when they poop them out, then you get a pepper plant, and the pepper plant spreads. So of course a bird is gonna hang out with a pepper, especially a pepper croc. And I really, really like how the little hair on top of these mons' heads changes as they evolve. On Fuecoco, it's just a little sprig, a little, a little tiny twig. On Crocolore, it resembles both a full sombrero as well as a whole bird's nest, singular egg and all, which in and of itself may be a reference 
reference to the strong maternal instincts crocodiles have, often carrying and protecting their babies on their heads. But then, when it evolves into a somber skeletage, the egg has hatched. Part of the nest is broken away now, and there's a little songbird on its nose. It's really cute, and I love the detail of the songbird becoming Skeletor's retro microphone when it sings. The heck is that? It is literally spitting fire. A slang term for speaking or singing with vehemence. Vehemence. I've never said this word out loud, but it's it's a passionate song that burns. Oh, and I probably don't have to mention that birds themselves are famous for singing. Yeah. Now, while made of fire, the idea of having twigs on top of its head like this is reminiscent of those sugar skulls too. They are often decorated with flowers and petals right on top of the crown, as well as all around them. In fact, the flower that is the most traditional to use is the bright yellow-orange Aztec marigold. It blooms with these big puffy petals and are draped around the skull, not unlike Skeletor's hair. And these flowers are specifically used because they symbolize the fragility of life, first of all, but also it is said that the souls of the dead really like them. Their bold colors and pungent scent creates a pathway for them to follow right to the offerings that have been made for them around the sugar skulls. <sighs> Man, this one's deep. And we're not even done yet, because in bringing up sugar skulls again, I can also talk about another part of Mexico's Day of the Dead celebration. The Alebrije. Brightly colored folk art sculptures of fantasy creatures. Egad, and they are bright, and there are so many fiery colors, and so many big spooky teeth, and with the association with the dead, it's just too perfect for Skeletorge. And these creatures are said to be spirit guides for the recently deceased. They collect souls and walk with them until they get where they need to go. And speaking of Mexican statues, I see these in Mexican restaurants all the time. Statues of men with sombreros tipped down like this, taking a siesta. The most widespread is Homko's Pedro Siesta, but they take on many forms, many very colorful ones as well, and the big sombrero and haunched over position definitely makes me think of Crocolore for sure, especially considering you typically have a siesta after eating a lot, and its previous form, Fue Coco, is obsessed with food according to its official description and the Mesoamerican connection supposedly don't stop there. This is Sapexcli, a red crocodilian sea demon from Aztec mythology with an insatiable appetite. Similar to Fuecoco's love of food, <laughs> uh, but it existed before creation. And in order to start creation, the four creator gods had to kill it. And they took its corpse and turned its bony tail into the underworld. Its body was turned into the earth and its head was split up into 13 pieces and formed the 13 heavens, which is kind of like Skeletor's 13 colored mosaic spots. Wow, that is very specific and way cool if that was intentional. Uh, but there's also Sochiano, an alligator god who sort of acts like the Cerberus of the Aztec world, to keep it really simple, and watches over the passing of souls to the underworld, and it stands guard if need be, and eluding or defeating it is required to pass on, and it's often depicted surrounded by flames, and of course then this association with souls, flames, and an alligator is a uh, very nice for our purposes here. But now, a fun fact! Many like to joke around about Pokemon who gain a ghost type upon evolving, saying, <laughs> they died. <laughs> but according to Skeletor's official description, it's actually two separate entities. The bird is a ghost soul that's possessed the fireball atop its head. So in a way, Skeletor itself is still just a fire type Pokemon, but its bird buddy is ghost type. So the whole thing is fire ghost all in all. Fun fact too! One Spanish tradition that dates back to the 15th century is giving kids Easter Mona on Easter. They are cakes decorated with Easter things, almost always a bird's nest around an egg, but sometimes they also come in animal shapes, and for whatever reason, I could not figure out why, but a crocodile is one of the most common animal shapes here. Why? <laughs> Time for another fun fact. Did you know that Christopher Columbus, while in America, stumbled upon a baby alligator and thought it looked like some of the iguanas and lizards back home, only more fierce? So he started away in his caraval and eventually made the voyage back to Spain. He did not expect it to grow nearly as much as it did during said voyage, though, which takes several months. So now there's just like an adolescent alligator in Spain and people are kind of freaked out by it. Maybe that's what inspired some of these ghost stories. Uh, but funnily enough, this isn't even the only crocodilian he confused for something else. He also brought back with him several Caribbean crocodile skins and gifted them to the king and queen of Spain, but he told the royals that they were the skins of giant serpents he had slain. And even in his own journal, he wrote down that he slew giant serpents for their skins, but like, they had legs. We, we know now that they were crocodiles. 
What a dip. Oh, so is that how this line fits the Chinese zodiac theory? Don't you dare ah. bring that up. You know, Spain is and was extremely Catholic, and the earliest serpents in the Bible had arms and legs. Maybe Columbus thought the paradise of the Caribbean was Eden or something. Hush. You know, the legendary basilisk is often described as a fire-breathing crocodilian with a bird head. Huh. That does kinda sound like Skeledirish. It's also the king of all serpents. No, you get out of here. You, you've ruined my comment section. Leave. <laughs> well, I brought up the Columbus alligator because yes, he stowed it away and brought it to Spain on his caraval. And that's a part of Quaquaval. So let's talk about these birds now. Quaxley, Quaxwell, and Quaquaval. Fun fact, the caraval was invented in Portugal. Bam, Paldea. Actually, Portugal invented a lot when it came to seafaring and the age of exploration. From whole styles of ship like the Caraval, Carrick, and Galleon, the first large ships capable of crossing entire oceans, to important sea charting and navigation tools like the Windrose, Nonius, and Mariner's Astrolabe, not to mention various cartography techniques. Oh, and to circle back a bit to Sprigatito, Portuguese maps and compasses would often use a fleur-de-lis to symbolize north. But really, if any of the starters are going to be more Portuguese than Spanish, it makes perfect sense to have it be the water type one due to all of this boat stuff. And it makes double sense to turn it into a bird, because birds themselves are also expert navigators, traveling huge distances every winter and then right back up. But also, also, a Portuguese man invented the first airship, the Passarola, a precursor to the hot air balloon, as it works in much the same way. It was the world's first known aircraft to affect its own flight, all the way back in 1709, though only four meters off the ground, and that was that. No further advancements were made for almost a century because the archbishop, who was about to become the pope, said it was the devil's work, and that the man who invented it was the devil's partner, so he obviously had to flee for his life. Yeah, that Michelangelo really was de Conti, and in typical Catholic Church fashion made it extremely difficult for science and technology to advance, and we actually know very little about the ship because most of the records of it were destroyed. Blasphemy. But according to the few sketches and diagrams, passarolas were to be typically decorated with paddles resembling bird wings and tails, and even had figureheads depicting magnificent bird heads, or a pigeon one time. And to make it all the more perfect for our purposes here, Bartholomew, the inventor, was Portuguese, but only technically. He was actually born in Brazil, but colonial Brazil, who owned Portugal at the time. And if there is anything super obvious about Quaquaval, it's that it is the most Brazilian Pokemon yet. Like, if there's one thing to know about Brazil, it's that most of its land is destroyed rainforest that is continuing to be deforested. But if there's one other thing, it's that the Rio Carnival is easily one of, if not the most famous carnivals in the world. I mean, look at this. Do I even need to say anything? You've seen these, right? Quaquaval is even doing the same style of dance that they're all doing. He has the same sort of feathers and headdresses as your traditional Brazilian carnival dancer. It's even in the name. Quaquaval uses the Brazilian spelling of the word carnival. Carnival. And just in case you don't know, Portuguese is the main language spoken in Brazil for the same reason English is in the US. And the Portuguese onomatopoeia for the sound a duck makes is quaqua. Quaquaval. It might not be fully a duck now, but it evolves from ducks. And the name is completely Portuguese, but it also even gets aqua in there and maybe even caraval. It is such an S tier name. And it's cry. Oh yeah, that sounds like a samba. The samba dance style itself also originated in and around Brazil. It's specifically a combination of Portuguese and Afro-Brazilian dance styles who were there because they were slaves. But get this, so Quaquaval evolves from Quaxley and Quaxwell. Both of those names pull from traditional boys' names, Braxley and Maxwell. And Quaxley is even dressed in a little Donald Duck sailor outfit, fancy little beret and all, which was a super popular dress style for little boys in the 18 and early 1900s in Europe. 
Europe and America after a young Prince of Wales was shown wearing one. It became quite traditional, and that's a big reason Donald Duck wears one also. It's an iconic navy and little boy outfit at the time of his creation. Plus, ducks float along the water really well, like a boat, a little sailor. Doot, doot. But back to the blue boys, them eventually evolving into this super flamboyant bird is absolutely perfect. Men are welcomed to dance in the Rio Carnival as well, notable due to the Pokemon names and also their uh, gender ratio. But more on the bird side of things, in many species of birds, the females tend to be a bit plain looking, while the males get kinda this. <laughs> And the majority of the most out there birds are of course tropical birds found in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. And it's more than just fancy feathers, many of these birds will put on dance shows, setting up and cleaning their stages before their performances even, dancing around with rapid feet movement up and down branches the same way Quaquaval dances with rapid feet movements. Even Quaquaval's signature move has the added effect of raising its speed stat. And on that note, the fancy flip kick it does with this move is somewhat evocative of capoeira, which is a martial art that combines dancing and fighting techniques, and also originated in Brazil. Remember, Quaquaval is water fighting type after all, and similar to how the best fighters have to be super fit and well-bodied, hardcore dancers do too. And look at its official description. Quaquaval is cheerful and energetic, and no matter the situation, it will shake its entire body in dances that evoke far-off places. Yeah, far-off places. Paldea is the Iberian Peninsula, and this bird is the most Brazilian thing imaginable. It even holds its arms out like Rio's Jesus statue. That was a joke, but notably, there is a carnival much closer to home. The Carnival of Santa Cruz de Tenerife is similarly bright, flashy, and flamboyant, and takes place on the Canary Islands, which are owned by Spain off the coast of Morocco and Western Sahara. It's actually a major tourist destination for Europeans. It's like going outside of Europe, except things are still owned by Europeans. Like the good old days! But that's getting a bit sidetracked. Let's look straight up at some bird biology for a moment. Ah! Quaxley and Quaxwell are ducks, and notably, there are a few duck species where the males are significantly more colorful than the females too, falling in line with many Amazonian birds. But more specifically, they resemble crested ducks. I mean, there's the big bouncy poof of feathers on their heads just like the Pokemon. These Pokemon even have boob physics. It's about time. And the little highlight on Quaxley looks like a cute little wave. And it's got the wing on its hip and the other one all sticking out all nice and fancy, which works well with its description. A serious mannered Pokemon that will follow in its trainer's wake. It's tidy and it especially dislikes getting its head dirty. Oh, it's always grooming and making sure its head feathers are clean, I can relate. It's like a nice and proper little well-mannered boy, so nice and clean in his brand new sailor outfit, which were typically the outfits they would graduate to once out of their toddler dresses. For a time, all toddlers were in dresses because it makes cleaning diapers easier. They also weren't really diapers at the time, it was just cloth, it was very messy. Its body is always glossy because the gel secreted by its feathers repels water and grime. The coif on its head is slit back using a rich, moist cream, and it becomes unkempt when dry. He's a little boy who cares a lot about not being messy. Gotta keep that hair gel in. But actually, this is a reference to how duck feathers work. Duck feathers are extremely hydrophobic, which means they don't like water getting married, and also, water is easily repelled off by them. A big part of this is that water and oil don't mix, and ducks secrete oil or wax that they then brush and spread throughout their feathers. But there is a bit more to it, too. The structure of duck feathers is almost maze-like, and there are multiple layers of different kinds of feathers stacked up on top of each other, trapping air bubbles inside and keeping any water that gets into the feathers trapped in the maze's dead ends, before eventually being shook or groomed out. So they are very waterproof and extremely buoyant, even compared to other waterfowl. And speaking of other waterfowl, this is the blue-footed booby, a waterfowl with iconically extremely blue feet, just like Quaxley. But now, let's evolve it and check out Quaxwell's feet. Oh, oh, it's got like shoes now? That's a bit odd. Uh, what are those? Uh, they look like Crocs. Are, are they quacks? Are they odd and seemingly out of place to reference the Lamiac from Basque mythology from northern Spain? Uh, they were essentially water sirens, except instead of a mermaidy fish tail, they just had duck feet. It's weird. Well, I guess feet like this kind of makes sense for a middle Evo. Quaxley has very clearly duck and booby feet, whereas Quaquaval's feet we haven't gotten to yet, but they are very much not duck feet. And so I guess Quaxwell is an in-between? They look a bit like swimming shoes or flippers 
mirrors with the strap and all, or given its pose, an uh, idle battle pose especially, and its attack animations, perhaps this is the duck version of a ballet shoe? I mean, Quaxwell's doing these ballet poses. Well, ballet or not, it's water type, so it makes sense that the head resembles a swimmer's cap, especially the ones that are designed for people with a lot of thick hair that can't so easily be packed down. And look, it's even wearing a little top, perhaps like a swimming top then? I mean, it's a duck, so swimming is a no-brainer, but it's like combining athletic swimming with ballet. What's the deal with that? Even its official description states, Quaxwell has a serious and stoic disposition. Oh, that explains the light blue part of the crest resembling super serious eyebrows. It has a tendency to compete with others to see whose kicks are the most graceful. It makes sure to consistently practice the fundamentals of its training wherever and whenever it can. Oh gosh, it is super serious about its dance. It's like an adolescent ballet dancer whose whole life revolves around the art of the dance and is strict about scheduling practice, but notably, again, he perfect kicks in both ballet and swimming, so like, what is- uh, Oh! Oh, I just remembered a thing! It's synchronized swimming! I mean, synchronized swimming is just kind of ballet on ice, except the ice is melted. What do you call that? Oh, a pool! As a sport, synchronized swimming got its start around 1891, when the first synchronized swimming club opened up in Berlin, Germany. And at the time, it was known as Water Ballet, which is honestly perfect. And a side note, as we explored in its video, Tandemouse is a very German Pokemon living in Paldea too, so it's not that odd. They're not neighbors, but they're close. Annette Kellerman of Austria would become the first big famous person of the sport when she and her team performed in New York in 1907, and she made headlines the world over and became known as the Underwater Ballerina. And by 1941, it became an officially recognized sport, and in 1984, it was added to the Olympics for the first time. But you will notice that none of those have anything to do with Spain or Portugal directly, though they were early adopters of the sport. The Portuguese Swimming Federation was founded in 1930, and they almost always have a team in any international competition, sometimes winning. But looking at all these swimmers now, it does kind of remind me of a group of ducklings following their mama in the water, more or less in sync with one another in order to better stick together. And that's enough of a connection, honestly. But backing up a bit, ballet would go on to become a much more Eastern European thing, but it did get its start in Italy and spread to other Mediterranean countries first, including Spain and Portugal. Ballet is tangentially a part of traditional Portuguese dance, though the vira is considered among the most traditional. It's similar to a waltz. Quaxwell does both, perhaps. And then, according to its official description, it observes Pokemon and people from various regions to incorporate their movements into its own dance routines. And remember, that's literally how the Samba came into being. It was the mixing that was happening in Brazil of the dance styles between these two regions and all the slaves they brought over. But just look at how much more free and fun Quaquaval is compared to the serious and stoic Quaxwell. It would seem this Pokemon has finally found its true passion and learned to grow up and just have fun with it. Pure fruity freedom! Do Quaxwell and Quaquaval got the booty? They do. Honestly, that might just be because of how ducks look when floating on the water. Like, they look like a big butt, and Game Freak just stretched out the legs and torso from it. But there is another possible thing we could get into here. Uh, Brazilian butts. Am I right? It's a major Brazilian stereotype. Respectfully, I like big butts! Respectfully, of course. I mean, there's articles about this. The Brazilian butt is an icon of the country, and this butt idea comes mostly from the samba dancers again. I mean, in order to do such intense dance as quickly and for as long as they have to do it come carnival time, you gotta be fit, especially in the gluteus maximus and other leg and butt muscles. And every year, Sao Paulo, Brazil, hosts the Miss Bum Bum contest to see who has the biggest and most well-defined butt in the country. And the winner of this contest gets 50,000 real. And even just to qualify, it must be 42 inches, have a smooth texture, and a firm, uplifted look. And Quaxwell and Quaquavals are certainly uplifted looking. But now that we've twirled around back to Quaquaval, let's talk more bird things. The way it shakes that thing in a samba style and has watery peacock feathers, of course, brings up the peafowl. Easily the most well-known example of a male bird being so much more than the female. And they too shake the booty. And they also have those beautiful colors, which they share with the Cayuga duck. Quaquaval is not fully a duck anymore, but its prevos are, and this could be the connecting link. However, there's more birds thrown in there, of course, like the coot. Look at those feet! It looks just like the weird end bits on Quaquaval's feet, which also resemble painted toenails. And some coots even come in iridescent peacock colors too. And many of them even have the upward booty. And the red knobbed coot even has a fancy head thing, like the red head feathers on Quaquaval. And it lives in Iberia. And then, because we can't have a chain of 
bird Pokémon that doesn't end with at least some part of a bird of prey, Quaquaval's beak and legs resemble various sea eagles. Feather pants. Even its feet are kind of like a mix of an eagle and a coot. And we actually just had a Pokémon that was 100% sea eagle, Hisuian Braviary, and it too has a big poofy head, though for different reasons. Actually, on top of resembling the big carnival headdresses, you could see Quaquaval's head as a follow-up to Quaxley's sailor cap. Now it's a captain or admiral's hat, which were very wide and often had feathers or decor representing feathers on them, and then pirates would steal them and put even more feathers in there. So all in all, it is a great bird. And this is a great trio of Pokémon. They all work really well together too. Now there's been some speculation that the starter Pokémon from more recent generations of Pokémon all share a theme with one another, and I definitely think that that couldn't be more obvious than with these three. While they all have their connections to the Iberian Peninsula, they also all have numerous connections from the Americas. In fact, the three parts of America too. In order, I might add. And they all have distinct connections to famous celebrations in those areas. The Rio Carnival, Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, and Mardi Gras. All three existing in their current form, how they are today, by mixing the traditions of the locals and the Iberians who came over. Things were rough when this meeting first took place. It was pretty tragic. I mean, if you wanted to, you could say that the theme of this the trio of Pokemon is a colonization, but humans have quite the ability to recover from tragedies, even those self-created. And while it's of course still happening, healing did happen. The cultures blended as they always do, and there is always a reason to celebrate life together. And what better time for Game Freak to use the theme of celebration than in the generation they finally surpass 1,000 Pokémon? And what better Pokémon to do it with than the starters? Your first Pokémon on this brand new adventure, in a brand new open world Pokemon game format. Go out and explore this region with your starter Pokemon, like the Iberian explorers from ages past, exploring the new world. Thanks so much for using your noggin and watching. If you like videos being deep and long up in your skull, then let me know down below. It's a new format we're trying. And while down there, why not subscribe and please consider supporting us on Patreon. Or even better, check out our merch store, noggin.net, where we've got this cute plushy little guy right here, Snagui, our fake mod mascot. And thanks again. Love you all. Let me know if I missed anything, because I always do. Toodles.